You're listening to a Roddenberry Podcast. You're listening to Mission Log the Orville, an episode-by-episode discussion of the adventures of the crew of the USS Orville. Mike, I am so excited that we are just going to sit here today and try to figure out something to talk about before season three of the Orville returns in June. Um, you know, I got I have no idea what else we're going to talk about because, but, but you, we, you know, I'm an improviser, so we can make this work. What do you mean you don't know what to talk about? It's Mission Log the Orville, where we're going to open that jar of pickles and look inside every episode for messages and meetings. But we already meetings. did that. Do we not have so, any episodes to... Did we not have an episode this week to watch? No, we have. We already talked to uh, Andre Bormanis, David A. Goodman. We don't. There's like, I don't know how else to stall, or like yeah. give us a good excuse to. Well, talk if you folks today. are willing to bear with us and uh, and hear us out for the next, oh, I don't know, however long it takes, uh, we might be able to come up with something. I mean, Jessica does have a background in improv. <gasps> it's funny you should say that. Wow. I do a great Seth MacFarlane impression. You know what? <laughs> that is really, that's a, a, such a great impression that, uh, yeah, you're just going to have to sit back and watch. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to do a, a quick costume change because even though my voice is really good and my mannerisms, I'm just going to do a quick costume change and I'll see you back here in a second. That sounds good. But, uh, but seriously, we have... Uh, a situation that's kind of been, you know, brewing for about the last month. Uh, our production opportunity. Uh, yes. Our uh, production folks uh, reached out to Seth MacFarlane and his team uh, to be interviewed prior to season three. And uh, he agreed to be on the show. And we got a chance to sit down a couple of days ago and do that. And uh, we're going to have that for you today. So sit back, relax, enjoy our time with Seth MacFarlane. On behalf of the Roddenberry Podcast Network and Mission Log, The Orville, we are delighted to welcome the creator of The Orville, Seth MacFarlane. So we've had two of your contemporaries with us, Seth, and this is the most important question. We're just going to get it out of the way, and hopefully it's not too big of a spoiler. But are you officially, on the record, a cat person or a dog person? Uh, you know, I... I, I oh, like... you have to answer one or the other. <laughs> I mean, I have two cats. But it's, you know, I had dogs growing up. It's just like, they're, they're, you gotta, I work like 90 hours a week, so you can't really leave a dog at home the way you, you know, even a cat gets a little ornery with you, but the cats at least are, are you know, I spend enough time with them during the day that, uh, that I, I could be a responsible cat owner. Yeah, well, so I just, ha- the reason why I didn't think you liked cats is because your you're, you're writers or you are so against them on Family Guy that I thought you had a real thing against them, so... Yeah, I, I actually have not written on Family Guy since about 2010 or 11. So and that you're would be, exonerated from that. Would be somebody with an axe to grind. Yeah, that statute of limitations is definitely over with. And, yeah. you know, I, I bet dog person just because Brian is sort of your on-screen persona in, in many ways. So Yeah, we, we had a – my family had a dog named Brian. He was a Malamute when I was growing up. So that's, that's, that's kind of where that came from. That's sweet. <laughs> that is awesome. So uh, you're a five-time Emmy Award winner. Hopefully all of this is correct. Uh, a five-time Grammy Award nominee, uh, an Oscar nominee, and you were inducted into the Television Hall of Fame, and you have a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. you think if I, un- I would be a happy person. <laughs> <laughs> but if I understand this correctly, your performance hosting the Oscars got you nominated for an Emmy. Did it? I, I guess. I, 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 sure. Why not? Let's go with that. Yeah. Okay. I just. I didn't know you that was a thing. You manifest that. Though. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm trying. I, it's been so. It, that was 2013. So I'm trying to remember exactly what the timeline was. Yeah. It, it, oh, it, but you didn't win, so it doesn't matter. I thought this was something recent. Didn't matter. No. No. no it didn't matter. 
<laughs> expunged from memory. Uh, I, just, I just thought that was a really neat way to kind of kind of bring things full circle. Emmy and Emmy nomination for hosting the Oscars. That's a pretty pretty it's outstanding Hollywood piece of trivia. Eating, I think Hollywood eating itself, <laughs> a self licking ice cream cone, as we call it. Exactly. Oh, well, funnily enough, years ago I got to see you and Sarah Bareilles perform together. So yes, what Mike would like to say is, we think you should be on Broadway next, and I think that's <laughs> is that actually something that interests you based off of. You know, it's it's a lot of it's a lot of work. It's it's just it's a time commitment that that I just don't know that I could take away from from my other jobs. I I would I would probably before I did Broadway, I would probably um, uh, do a film musical of some kind. That's still sort of on my to do list, um, mainly because the orchestras are bigger. Uh, but oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, that's that's still on the bucket list. We'll we'll get to that at some point. Yeah, Broadway's a Broadway's a real commitment. Um, I mean, look, I had to drink before I did the Oscars, so I don't know that I could do that every night on a stage. In New I York. think anyone would say, like, someone I know performed for Ilya Kazan and said, "You need to have a shot of alcohol before you go live." And I think it's yeah. part of the if tool was, belt. No one talks about. If it was just a shot that did it, then I think it would be fine. <laughs> but with the Oscars, it was like three tumblers full of bourbon before I even walked out on stage. So it was the only way I was getting through it. I love that you mentioned the orchestra part of it. I think it's such a huge aspect of everything you do, and you've talked about its importance for Family Guy, and it's so clearly its own character in the Orville. When so I'm so curious of like how you got to be at this position where you're like I get to do whatever the hell I want and I want a whole art orchestra. When did you know you wanted that and like really made that part of your writer? Well, I mean, it's different. You know, for Family Guy, I think it's about fifty or sixty. Um, for the Orville, it's about ninety each week. And to me, it's you know, look, if you're spending the kind of money that these platforms spend for visual effects. For uh, for sets, there's you don't want to limp to the finish line with like a Casio, you know, doing your score. It's it's really a, for a show like this. It's it's a character like anything else, yes. and it's, particularly if you have composers that can really, um, you know, manage an ensemble that size, it, it's almost essential. I mean, the, the the Orville, I think there's times almost to a fault. I'm in the mix, and I'm like, can you turn the music up a little bit because it's really good, <laughs> and and the trick is to you know, not scream it in people's faces. Uh, but the, it, it's a very important part of, of certainly of this show, certainly of Orville. Early on, Jessica identified me as the music guy on the show and uh, on our podcast. And it is, I'm glad you touched on that. It is a character in the show. It brings you into that suspension of disbelief. It raises the tension. It's, it's world building. It's part of the show and it's done so incredibly well. And when I see the orchestra recording music on YouTube videos, it is a phenomenal effort. That is in and of itself a world-class production and it's just part of this of this bigger uh tv show that you've that you've done now for two seasons working on on number three yeah uh, it, it's 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 in many ways my favorite part it's the one part of the process where i don't really have to do anything but sit back and watch um you know it's 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 the one part of the industry that's still you know as as much as i dabble in music it's the one part of the film industry that still has an air of mystery to me i I, you know visual effects i i'm amazed at what these artists are doing i kind of have a sense of you know how it's being done but it's still incredible um set design you know writing direction there's there's so many parts of the business that are you've, you've now seen you know what's behind the curtain you've seen how the wizard makes the big head and these symphonic scores and how quickly these composers write this music and it, it, it's there's I still walk in there and I'm still just my mind is blown. But you have ninety people who are playing this music really the first time they're seeing it, wow. um, and you know these these contract musicians that this is just what they do. They rehearse a few times, maybe if it's a big cue, maybe three or four times, and then you record it, and it sounds like they've been rehearsing for a month. It's 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 an extraordinary thing to watch. And also never, to know as the composer, this is when we need to hear something. This is when we don't need to hear something. Yeah, and to know that it's all original, that it's all brand new, written you know in the past month or two months, and uh, yeah, and we're we're lucky. We have some we have some terrific composers on the show. This this season is sort of a next. This upcoming season is sort of a next level of. 
of symphonic uh, inclusion. The bulk of the work was done by John Cotty, um, and and is it Debney? Uh, yeah, John John, John Debney, Debney and, and Matthew Cotty, Cotty uh, yeah. uh, Kevin Koska, and then uh, and Joel McNeely, who who has scored most of the shows this year. Who's who's um, and I've worked with him for about ten years. Uh, uh, really, just kind of kind of the sound of the Orville. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's there's some great scores this year. Oh. Well, we're looking forward. No, we're looking forward to hearing them, and I'm looking forward to hearing what Jessica was about to say. Well, so there's so many things I want to talk about, especially. So I've had people that have had the pleasure of being on set with you, and they talk about how detail oriented. So it's kind of you are. So it's nice to know that, like with music, you just go, ah, I enjoy it, or I don't. So, but what is that penchant of yours that's like I have to make sure the the pips and the ranks are exactly right? Like, where does that creativity exist in your brain? Is it more compulsion, or is it like? Or excitement. I don't know what I'm trying to ask. Are are you OCD and are you undiagnosed? It's 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 probably a little of both. My my psychiatrist will say like the same things that you know are the reason you're talking to me right now. You know, in therapy, the same things that that f- you up are the things that make that enable you to do. You same know, side of the coin, right? Or different side of the so same coin. It is part of it. it the, the only part of it I can really quantify is that if I'm spending. 12 and 13, 14 hours a day, and in some days, some weeks, seven days a week working on something, I better be really happy with it by the time I walk away because it's you, you're, the expenditure, the life expenditure that you commit to with something like this is, I mean, it's your life. Like, you, you, it's all you do. You know, it's, 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 it's why so many marriages collapse. In because it's, <laughs> you're just working all the time. And, and this is a, a perfect example. Um, so, you know, if I'm putting in that kind of sweat, the trade-off is all right. If I'm going to put in this kind of time, I I, I want to be happy with everything. Um, I mean, it's that, sort of that simple, I guess. I think that's great because you also know when people you can sort of tell when someone has the vision up front, or is trying to fix things on the back end. And yeah. from we have the pleasure of talking to Andre and David too. And yeah. so not only do you have like really excellent people working with you, you've collected those people and brought them with you. So you also have people that are on your side but know how to challenge you. So how important are they to that process of like seeing that through for you? Very important. I mean, for, for me, the best case scenario, and, and there are a lot of, there are a lot, certainly my production designer, Stephen Lineweaver, Myrie Chisholm, who did, uh, you know, she was our costume designer. Um, you know, our visual effects supervisors, Brooke Noska and Brandon Fayette. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of people, of course, Howard Berger, our makeup, makeup, uh, artist, there are a lot of people who you can you you can just kind of trust them to do their jobs, and it's still a huge undertaking. But at least, you know, I'm at a point with these people where, all right, I can walk onto a set. I know I'm probably going to like what he's done before I even walk onto the set. That I, I don't micromanage for the sake of micromanaging. I love my favorite thing in the world is when I cast an actor and I don't have to do anything like I don't have to direct that actor they come in already knowing what they want to do with the part and it aligns with what's on the page Mm -hmm. and all I got to do is point the camera that's that's an ideal situation I I I don't you know I I know there's like some directors who kind of have to pee on everything I'm not one of those people it's a gift when you know It's someone else's pee. I started, I, well, that's a great mm-hmm. Brian reference somehow, but <laughs> I, I started out that way thinking that unless I did every piece of it, it wasn't great. And then recognizing that, A, no one has the potential, no one has the time to yeah. do that. But then also you can have the some parts make something greater. So do you, is there something that happened where it's like, ah, shit, that was a mistake, but oh, we have a better show because of it that you can think of off the top of your head? Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's, even even with that kind of a team to rely on, it's still a moment. It's it's a mountainous undertaking. Like you're still working crazy hours a week. I mean, a, a, a better way to kind of to lens it would be, I mean, Family Guy, for example. When I created the show, the Brian Stewie relationship wasn't something that ever occurred to me. There was a writer, Gary Janetti, um, who who wrote on the show, who, who really kind of locked into that and wrote that first episode. And that's a good example of you create something and then other people come on board and they find things in it that you didn't see and they make it better. That's, that's the essence of what, 
you know, when you really succeed, I think in, in this business is, is, you know, if you like, you're going to get plenty of glory. You don't need to fight. You, you don't, you don't need to, to make it all about yourself. Mm-hmm. There, there are people who can, who can and do improve on what you did. And, and that's, that's, that's probably the best example I can think of. That's, that's really the most fundamentally, uh, impactful relationship on family guy i think is that brian stewie relationship and, and i wish i could take credit for that but i can't but well that's but you're a better leader for not i'm gonna let mike talk yeah. i have all these questions Go yeah we it, we have so many questions we're, we're hitting on we're so gonna, many we'll things in, we'll see you in here until five you got you guys can have more time if you want if cassie will allow it we'll, oh we'll, i don't I, great. We'll, awesome we'll, i'll we'll, use it uh, we'll use it i'll show we'll you we'll find facts. out here <gasps> That's awesome. Um, so Mission Log began when Rod Roddenberry decided to do a deep dive into each episode of Star Trek, looking for meanings, morals, messages, and to see if each episode stands the test of time. And we've applied that format to the Orville, as you know. And we, I mean, we parse every episode. And episodes that you've written and people in your writer's room, your producers, co-producers, um, have written, have dealt with grief, women's rights, social media, porn addiction, religious zealotry, and the hard science of astrology. <laughs> So, it broke my heart. It um, broke my heart. How do you decide which episode, which issues to tackle, and and which of those ep- episodes do you think were tackled particularly well? Um, show, well shows that have aired thus far. Uh, I mean, that's that's a tough one. I, I I mean, look, you you can you can write about something, and then the fall, the day after the show airs, you can read something that changes your opinion or or broadens your opinion. That happens all the time you know certainly with with an episode like about a girl at the time that was you know we, we felt like we were locked into what this was there there are things uh now that that i that i might do differently um just as far as how i i, I break the, even just the use of language in that in that mm-hmm. show I think we all learned. We even yeah. learned while we were covering that episode. I talked to a good um, transgendered friend of mine who, more than anything, just congratulated the fact that a primetime show was talking about it and still had a ways to go. But you don't want to scare an ally away from learning more by saying, you screwed that up. Yeah, and, and I think we see a lot of both. I, or I, I see a lot of both. I see people who, who have that same reaction as your friend um, who are like, yeah, great, you're partway there thanks for talking about it now here's here's what i can add to the here's what you may, might might have left out sure and then you have the other side where it's you know how dare you try to tell this story without getting everything right and that i, I have no defense for because i it, we're you know we're, we're you, you can only cover the bases that you, you nobody's perfect but um but i think at each each time you get a little better at it um you know as far as the episodes that that succeed in in um i mean to me my my favorite episode that we've done of the first two seasons was was lasting impressions which wasn't really that deep an episode when it came to um uh talking about any particular social issue but to me it was this kind of show at its best where it's just it's 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 all about the people um and doesn't really re- require a whole lot of money it, it, it all it requires is a really good story and and the wherewithal to explore all facets of it so um i mean look there are things like mad idolatry i like that episode i think that was a fun show that 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 explored religion in kind of a messed up way um but uh it's tough i mean i there are things i love about all the episodes and there are things i look back at and i'm sure with season three it'll be the same thing I, i i feel like we've we're working on all cylinders this season. I think we've done some of our best work, but I'm sure I'll look back in the future and say, yeah, you know, we could have done that a little differently. Well, let me ask you this because you, you segued perfectly into my next point. The The second half of season two, uh, the second half of season two really, really took off, not just in ratings, but the critics finally got on board. Um, lasting impressions had about 3 million viewers the night of, which was, you know, slightly above average, I think 3.3 million, but about five and a half million people ended up watching the show by the end of the week uh, through on demand. And just by word of mouth and that kind of thing. So just a bunch of a bunch of momentum there by the end of the season. Um, first of all, were there were there any sort of lessons learned through that first season and a half that really contributed to the success of the the second half of season two? And just just the follow up would be. Um, 
how much of that momentum were you able to keep through the the extended time off? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the big lesson, the big lesson was tone. I mean, I, you know, we set out to, we did set out to do a sci-fi show that had comedic elements to it. I think what exactly, how exactly that manifested itself and, and how we intended for it to manifest itself changed a lot from season one or season two, uh, from season one to season two. Uh, cer- certainly in season two, I mean, look, I, the, the stories that we told in season one, I, I stand by. The way we executed some of them, I, I wince a little bit when I go back and I look because we've kind of settled into this self-admission that we really are a, a, a dramatic sci-fi show with comedic elements that come through the personalities of the characters. And certainly in, in season three, I feel like we're firing on all cylinders um, as far as embracing that that paradigm. Uh you know, it was it was around, um, yeah. The, the the God, I'm trying. I'm thinking about what was the second to last episode of season one. Yeah, probably probably late in probably late in season one. Around Mad Idolatry was when I feel like the show started to kind of figure out what it what it was. And going into season two, um, it was it was really kind of settling in. And of course, like many shows, season three is when you really kind of start to be a fully formed organism. Um, yeah, I mean, part of the thing was that Fox had marketed the show as a hard comedy at the beginning. Um, I think in many ways the pandemic actually helped the show take a step away and gave people a chance to kind of discover it on their own terms um, and not be told what it was. And, and I, how many people discovered it during that time, we're about to find out wow. because I... I, I just don't know. We're only going to know after season three airs. So apart from just PR alone, right? Or it's just like, oh, Seth MacFarlane is doing Family Guy in space. We have you on a whole new platform, which is exciting. When you knew that switch was going to happen, what did you as a creator and as the captain go, I can finally do this now? Or I'm excited I can have the budget for this, or if on, any. Yeah, on, on Hulu, you mean? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's twofold. I mean, the, the budget budgets are are. I mean, look, it's a wonderful thing because you can, of course, logistically do things you couldn't do. It, it, you got to be really careful when the larger budget comes that you don't that you you still are doing a show about people. That if someday that budget went away, you'd still be able to make the show, and you haven't locked into um, this this trap of of. Uh, of, of only of, of relying on the visual effects budget to tell your stories. I, I think we've done that in season three. There's there there are some shows in season three that are, I think, scope wise comparable to anything I've seen on TV. There are other shows that are pretty small. Um, so we do try to to do both. The, the big difference for me being on Hulu or any streaming platform, and the thing that frustrated me the most about being on Fox or on any network was, uh, I guess, particularly Fox. Um, was that you? There was just no time to create moments, and by moments I mean uh, anything from, you know, in the original Star Wars where Luke is standing on that uh, sand dune looking out at the two suns, and you hear the score, and there's there's or or to use a Star Trek reference, um, you know that that aggressively earnest moment where Wesley Crusher comes out in his Starfleet uniform for the first time and is that big orchestral so he sits down and, and it's 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 a very heartfelt moment but it takes time to do those you have to kind of you have to kind of commit to the to the to the fact that you're going to be lingering on this for a little bit it's really hard to do with network TV because you can have a scene that is perfect that creates the emotional moment that you want um but you got to cut it down because you got to squeeze everything into 43 minutes and that's not really not how storytelling works not every story is 43 minutes some are shorter some are longer and that was what got really frustrating is that you know there were moments in lasting impressions where i i look at it now and i'm like that scene needed more time that scene that needed a longer beat that needed a mo- the scene with um gordon and kelly in 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 his quarters at the very end they were both those actors were fantastic in that scene, uh-huh. um, but 
I wanted to, I, you know, I wanted more of it. I, I, I wanted to give them a little bit more time to breathe and you can't do it. It's the unspoken jazz notes, right? Like just yeah. let, because we're, also your audience is caught up with you. And this is one of my favorite things to compliment the show on. And I got to talk to David and Andre about it. You guys spent so much time making us interested in the characters from the beginning of when you meet them as the captain and then from every episode that going moving forward that everything is earned but you're right i think i'm looking forward to seeing just those lingering moments of them looking outside of the starship or think we or yeah. where we are projecting our thoughts onto them too yeah, yeah. identity our, our, our goal this season there there are moments on this show i hope people will will be genuinely weeping yeah. If oh, we've done you already had me. You we've, got me with lasting impressions already yeah. every time, though. So I don't, please don't do that to me. <laughs> we uh, we you we've identified. Right? Yeah, identity one and two would not have worked without um, a happy refrain or into the fold. You know that right. that oh, character development just just needed to be there. And as far as those moments to breathe, one of the things, and I'm not sure if it's part of a format or just something that happens organically or something that uh, just happens subconsciously, is that. It seems like nearly every episode has a conversation about halfway through where where Ed and Kelly or uh, Kelly and Claire just ask a question. They just ask the questions. Who are we to decide this? Who are we to impose our ethics on somebody else? If we're not going to defend the principles on which we were founded, what are we doing here? And that question gets asked. It doesn't get preachy. It doesn't have the, the you see Timmy moment where you, you, know, you, you have your public service announcement. It just asks the audience to think. And that's the kind of thing that, that as you mentioned before, I hope doesn't get lost in that big no. special effects budget. No, if anything, if anything it, it, it's more serviced because we have the time. Yeah, no, that's, that's, a, that's a fundamental part of this show that 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 is is still the heart and soul of that hasn't gone away um if anything there's more of it particularly in a in a, in a few episodes that that i mean that's at, that's at the heart of it so um yeah i mean that's but that's that's the fun stuff to write those are the most fun scenes to write it, it's you know. Two two of them in particular, and I was going to kind of leave this as an aside, except Jessica convinced me to bring it up with you. Um, both from tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, uh, Kelly uh, said this. Uh, Adrian Palicki, who is awesome. Uh, I used to say things like, find my soulmate. Well, guess what? You don't find soulmates. You become soulmates by growing together. And if you've been through... Uh, if you've been through this marriage like I have, you'd be wise enough to know that. Just just a, a beautiful sentiment. I've been married 19 years, coming up on 20. I needed to hear that. And I also needed to hear marriage changes. It evolves. It goes through phases. There's times where you feel like you don't love the other person anymore and that you never will. And then one day, you do. That is life-changing writing. When you dig into every line of a show like Jessica and I do, you find things like that that you can apply to your life to put things in perspective and make better decisions. And that's why we love the show, and that's why we are so thankful to have you on here. Not that we're done yet. I just wanted to throw that <laughs> well, out we'll, there. We'll, we'll, uh, share, we'll save Cassie from having a, an anxiety attack, too. Yeah, that, that, that's a, I mean, it, 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 that's a good, uh, it's a good example of, of a moment that, that um, it, again, doesn't need to be on a sci-fi show, which, and I say that as, as a as a as a positive thing. Like that, that's those are the moments that if you can sustain those, you know, you're still about the people. Um, in, in the back of my mind, you know, my my strangely, my 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 goal with this show, to some degree, is always like, all right, we know we can do sci-fi, we know we can reach that audience, but if we can also write a script that, and look, this is what. Uh, you know, the next generation did so. They, they, I mean, they're really the only sci-fi show that I can think of that ever really did this uh, successfully to such a degree. You know, I think to myself, all right, uh, we can get the sci-fi audience. If 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 my mother was watching this show, who who never, as long as she was alive, had had just no interest in sci-fi, no interest in the genre. But every once in a while, there'd be an episode of that show. I'd be like, yeah, check this one out. This one, this one, you might like. And when it was about the people, when it was about a personal story, um, and the people felt multidimensional and not just action figures and uniforms, that's when it really got good, and you realized they're doing something special here. And that that that's over the years. That that's a big lesson that I took, certainly from that show, and and um, uh, that I've tried to apply to the Orville. That that it, the characters should be as dimensionalized 
you know, as if I was watching a, a, a drama, as if as if I was watching, you know, Big Little Lies or, or, or a prestige drama. Like it, it, you have, you don't get a, an out. You don't get a get out of jail free card just because you're on a spaceship. You have to play by the same dimensionalized rules of character. So, and that and that seems a good example of where we where we were trying to do that, and 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 it, and it seems to have worked. And that's one of the things we talk about on Mission Log all the time, is that science fiction, when done well, is not about 400 years in the future. It's not about a spaceship. It's not about quantum drive. It's about people right here, right now, today. Now, what sci-fi does do well is give you a global perspective on things Mm -hmm. and allows you to look at these issues from a global perspective, possibly from a less biased position, because it's not us, it's them. Somebody else. Right. It's the Calavan, or it's the, or it's the Mocklins, or it's the Krill. It's not us. Um, and that, that depth of character uh, is is you, is done so well. And people talk about the comedic elements. Some of the f- funniest times I've ever had has been at work with people I work with, right? Mm-hmm. Because they, it's you know that's not mutually exclusive of of having fun and, and being funny. Um, we could do a whole show on COVID delays and things like that. How'd you keep the whole band together during uh, during the break? You know, I I am um, as as surprise surprise. I'm I'm somebody I have a great respect for science. Um, we we hired. Uh, I mean, look, Disney had their protocols, and they're very good protocols. We also hired an, an outside consultant firm called Pan Defense, which was run by. Um, this fellow, Dr. Larry Brilliant, of all names. Wow. Who used to work for the World Health Organization and was one of the key players in the smallpox eradication and created this consultant firm afterwards that dealt with pandemics. And so when COVID came around, um, you know, I'd, I'd been familiar with his work um, tangentially through through a couple of friends who were doctors and, and they, they were we revered this guy and I looked into it and just wrote him a letter and said listen we're this was early on so we have no idea how we're gonna get back to work do you have any advice and he uh, brought the company on board and really helped us create our protocols um, to the point at which we were really the safest set in town um, and uh, it, it was it was really the only way we could have finished the show um, with, with, you know, there, I mean, there are crowd scenes where you have a hundred people, I think, you know, 200 people on a couple of occasions in the middle of a pandemic, how do you keep those people safe? Um, and we did not have one transmission on set. Not I, even, don't, I don't think any other set can say that. Yeah. It, they, it's, a, it's a pretty amazing group of people. And, and again, I like for me sitting on those zooms once a week with this team of epidemiologists, which should have been dull. It was so interesting. I'm like, I feel like I'm at a free college lecture. Um, on, on I'm like listening to a podcast. I know French now or whatever. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, it, it was. It was. A, it was really fascinating. I mean, it was a pain in the ass, but at the same time, it was a really interesting bit of schooling and something that I really had no real knowledge of. I think I can sleep at night though, too, knowing that you took care of people and you did the best. Like, there's so many people who could view themselves as above the rules with this and a lot of people do but you know that you kept people safe and i think that kind of integrity shows up in your work too because you you share you you share your views honestly online you share your views as honestly as possible in the present moment in your shows and you also you back it up with action so i think that's really admirable well, we try <laughs> and uh david a goodman and Andre Bormanis, both uh, friends of the show, both independently and unsolicited, and I think unpaid. Mm, I'm uh, probably scared. Uh, reflect, <laughs> <laughs> uh, reflected. Uh, what? Just, just admired your leadership style. Uh, they, they both called you. Uh, I think the smartest person they know, <laughs> and and they said you were a very effective leader and a, and a great manager. Um, any any tips? Any uh, anything about your leadership style that uh, if you, you think give resonates one so well? What would it be? <laughs> I mean, look, you can be FDR or you can be Hitler. I mean, those are the two choices. It's it's uh, FDR surrounded himself with people who who, who could wow. do their jobs. Better. I don't know, man. No, it's I, good. No, I love it. I, it's, really, it's 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 really uh, to me. It's 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 the knowledge that look, you you have to have a clear idea of of what you want. It's a balance. You have to have a clear idea of what you want and and 
allow people to to know that you know this we're not just guessing here this is what we're after but at the same time that each department head each person can do their job better than you can do their job and if you let them do their job um, you're going to get to a place where you can walk on to that set and go, I know I'm going to like this before I even show up because I have the right people. It's, it's, it's casting. It's all casting. So once you have those people in place, and it takes years, obviously, to build that team. But once you have that team, um, you know, it just it just gets more and more. It, it's still a ton of work, but, um, you know, it, it's that. And also there's there's no... Like I'm trying to think, I don't think there's ever a point on set where I've lost my. I hope. Um, I think at the end of the day, there's a there's a. I, I can I can be passive aggressive at times, but that's that's the Connecticut in me. That's the worst that it gets. Um, you know, but it's it, it, for the most part, it's it's a pretty calm set. Um, you know, if if people are are. Are, are if it's the right bunch of people and, and it's the right department heads and it's the right craftsmen, it's the right visual effects artists and you know it's it's gonna work and and you don't leadership is really just you don't really have to do much to i guess to to, to have that said about you um i don't know like i i, I by, the, by season three i was just surrounded by people who were just and you, you look you see it all over the show the stats are magnificent this this year the the visual effects are magnificent the costumes are gorgeous the music is gorgeous i mean it's just it's just a really talented group and every every person had such a command of their department um that it just all came to, and then it's my job to figure out how it all glues together well we're excited to rip each episode apart you know and and <laughs> magnify glass everything but uh, and we're also going to respect your time. We could talk forever, but we got you for 40 minutes, which is awesome. I have one last question. If if you could summarize the entire new season in one word without spoiling it, what would it be? Uh, coexistence. Ooh. That's a good theme. <laughs> yeah, that's the that's probably the overarching theme. The, the, the challenges of coexistence figures very prominently throughout the season. Well, I can't wait to dissect that. Thank you so cool. much for talking to us. Oh, thank you guys. We love what you do. Mike, I did such a good job as Seth. You are so good. In fact, you, you even took up two out of the three squares on my screen. So I don't know if that was so, sort of a uh, a Picard maneuver, you know, when it looked yes. like he was in two places at once. No, or... it was like Riker when he splits himself in the... Oh, so you were yeah. like Thomas Jessica Lynn Verde and exactly. just Jessica Jessica Lynn Verde. Or Thomas Boimler for <laughs> those that like... <laughs> Lower decks. I think they who use doesn't the same like name. lower decks. Um, so that Some was people. that was a couple of days ago. But through the magic of uh, of podcasting and uh, editing, uh, I've had a couple and of days. Earl, thanks and, to Earl and Earl. Um, we've had a, I've had a couple of days to think about how it went. So let me your impressions first. Oh God, I don't know what you want me to say. Seth is great. That I was. I don't think I was nervous to interview him because obviously he's a professional, and obviously I I knew going into it that he likes what we do and he values the content we put out there about his great work, and it it was just so easy to talk to him. It was so engaging to talk to him. I was I'm not surprised about most of the stuff he talked about, and even as myself being a creative i learned a lot just by talking to him i'm sure you could tell just based off the questions i was asking like part of my brain was like looking oh how do you run a show or how do you do these mm -hmm. things you know uh so it was just a blast it was a blast talking to him it was so you know you did mention kind of your run-up of emotions going into it and i got uh you know a conversation or two i had that morning people asked me if i was nervous and i was like honestly no you know i'm excited um, you know, really looking forward to it. Uh, but I just, I never really did get nervous. And if there were any nerves, um, 
I mean, man, he put us at ease right away. I mean, just just as soon as he as soon as he logged in, uh, mentioned just unsolicited that he you know he liked the show, he liked what we do, and that he and he listened to it, and he was just so easy to talk to, just exactly what you would expect. Um, you know, great self deprecating sense of humor, very very humble, uh, very knowledge, knowledgeable, very thoughtful. I mean, it wasn't mm-hmm. you know answers weren't you know he didn't try to access the nearest bullet point that was close to what we asked or sidestep it by saying, that's a great question, Mike, but let me say this about that and then answer yes. a completely different question. Yes. He very thoughtfully answered all of our questions. Um, even where th- there was one point where he said, man, that's kind of a hard question. Let me think about that for a second. And he did, and he came up with a great answer. Well, and I think the best way to look at, at interviewing anybody, like even when we had the pleasure of interviewing Andre and David, um, those are questions any other person might ask them, but it's really mm-hmm. how our rapport, like, you know, our listeners are going to listen for how we interact with those people. Right. We're not going to get a scoop, but they enjoy however you and I mm-hmm. get along. And now we just get to throw Seth in the mix or David or Andre. And it was it was so easy. It was so fun. Um, it made me even more excited for season three than I already was. Um because also, I just want to support the heck out of him. I just Me think too. he's doing yeah. great work. And it was, you know, I didn't want to get into, you know, my list of questions wasn't, you know, how did things start out? Why are you doing the Orville? You know, all of that's all those things have been asked and answered, right? If you want to, if you want to hear that, you can you can get that somewhere else. But the questions that we asked, I think, were, uh, you know, a little bit different, a little bit more, you know, uh, of the time right now, and not, you know, of you know, background leading up to the show. Uh, but the one, the, I think the the one question and answer that stands out most in my mind was your question. When you put the poor man on the spot and made him sum up three years of work in one word. Uh, one season, <laughs> only one season. But they've been working on it for three years. Oh, that's fair. You're right. You're right. You're right. I feel like he acted like he didn't have the answer to that, though. You think, he had, you think he had so the answer? Good. It was such a no, good answer. Coexistence. No, he did yeah, it's such a good answer. Um, that I like. I like. I end my podcast that way sometimes. Like, how mm-hmm. would you sum this up? It was kind of my signal to like, hey, thank you for the extra time. I'm just going to ask you one more simple question, even though it's not that simple, and it still pertains to the goal of what this podcast was was to get hyped for season three. And really and truly, I, th- I that's kind of what I reflected on more than anything after talking to him is the theme of coexistence and how it does encompass so many different things that we are going through today to your point exactly of this is not about the future it's about humans in space which is what any good star trek is Mm -hmm. and how can we reflect back the issues that we are going through today in a lens that is a little bit more hopeful so coexistence under that lens in how we're truly i you know i stopped myself from talking about uh russia's horrible attack of ukraine but like that's a, a vision, a version of coexistence that we're struggling with right now, Correct. or coexistence with our planet and in existing harmoniously, mm-hmm. um, and just coexistence or coexistence with, e- with different political sides, just with each other, like with that. your neighbors, with your with your family, with your family at Thanksgiving dinner, um, it's or a whatever simple holiday answer. you choose. It's like a simple answer, but it does encompass so many different things that we struggle with. It does. It's big picture stuff. And that's why I like sci-fi when sci-fi is done well. And I think the Orville is doing it well. And I think it's doing it even better from what I've seen and heard about season three is looking at human issues, looking at what it looks like, what it means to be a human being from a global perspective. Mm-hmm. Totally. And, and, and that's what I got out of. So what... Uh, uh, what have, what what have we learned the last few weeks, maybe about season three, that's got you excited, that's got you yes. amped up or concerned, maybe even? No, 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 no. I don't think concerned is is even. Well, on... I didn't want to, you know, lead the witness. Oh, I hear you, um, and I don't <laughs> feel led. Uh, but thank you for that, for the permission to be a thinking person. <laughs> Um, wow. Wow, I just got canceled. <laughs> and I'll be signing off right now, folks. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, now this is just the Jessica show. Uh, no, you're wonderful. Uh, I Actually, what I, what I can glean so far based off of the enthusiasm and not just like selling this show because they have to, is um, the integrity of the original show that we liked is intact. And all they got to do was just make it even bigger and and, but like from what i can tell they still didn't lose sight of the important storytelling that they were doing and the human aspects of the story so like 
I loved how Seth was talking about how they get to build out these moments, right? right. That you, you're going to have an episode that's might just be 40 minutes long on Hulu, but you might have an episode that's a hundred, uh, you know, um, um, an hour seven and you'll get these, you'll, you'll get something. The audience is really smart. And if you let the audience just live with an actor that isn't really saying that much, we can, that's how we can experience art and humanize it for ourselves. Yeah, so you don't have to spell everything out. Let it I'm breathe, excited like for said. that. I'm excited. Uh, yeah, same same here. Um, I think they have from talking to David and Andre and and now Seth and we're Bar gonna have burners. another supplemental coming up oh, before season oh, three. Well, don't that we just, overpromise that we just want to that we just want to tease. Possibly we'll see. we might we'll see we may. Um, what I've found is that the show has really found itself. Where they all said that you know Fox marketed it as a comedy right away, um, but what they're really finding out is that it really is more of an hour long drama with comedic elements and that's exciting to hear when we asked about that that kind of pause during the show to just just ask the questions right not have a you see team you see timmy moment not get lectury not get preachy but just ask those questions and let the audience think because the audience is smart enough to think for themselves much much like you jessica um it is uh that was very very um exciting for me to hear because that's that's the heart of the show to me those conversations you know with ed and kelly or claire and kelly or you know sometimes even gordon and ed or somebody else or maybe two other characters that we don't even you know haven't really thought of yet yeah because we get to we have a whole new ensign or lieutenant um joining us yeah charlie burke right which is, I'm, first of all, I love when girls are named boy names, um, yeah. which doesn't matter in this world. But I, I've always wanted to be like a Georgie or a Sammy. That was but pretty much our, our strategy with our daughter. She's a Riley, which was traditionally a boy's name. Um, but we were going to go with like Veronica and nickname her Ronnie or Michelle and call her Mickey. Like that was always that kind of. So cute. Oh, Mickey yeah. is such a cute nickname. Yeah, I think so I too. I freaking love that. But uh, girls' names isn't all we talk about on Mission Log the Orville. <laughs> for the most part, no. <laughs> so, what are you excited about, Mike, for season three? Um, I'm excited about the the extra time to tell an encapsulated story. Uh, I think an issue with serialized storytelling is that you go through a uh, a season or a, or a series in in the more you know international uh, convention, and it's one story essentially, uh, with maybe maybe one message, moral meaning thrown in there. Uh, but when you have a, a ten episodes in this up- upcoming season three is of it ten? Yorville, is it 10? it's ten, I believe. I I don't. For some reason, you know. I'm remembering eight, but that's probably because I'm watching Bridgerton right now. Okay. So. Yeah, I think it was 10 versus 13, but they're longer, so the content is about the same, is, is my understanding. I could be wrong. Um, but then you get 10 different stories to reflect upon, and even though the characters can have character development and growth and things that carry from episode to episode to episode through that, um, you're really looking at 10 different kind of scenarios to uh, to think your way through. And I'm excited about that. I really, really am. Totally. Uh, and I, th- I think I think you and I can both agree that, well, I was going to say the same thing I've already said in a different way. But, but you know, the excitement for the show I don't think has gone away. I think Seth said this too. Maybe perhaps more people have had a gone has gotten an opportunity to come to find this show in their own way. I know that I got to, well, because I'm, you know, getting paid to do a podcast. Thank but- you, Rod. I flip in love with this show. I really yeah. do. Like legitimately, you know, the trailer gave me chills. The new posters look amazing. Every time they post, like yeah. every time Seth or the cast posts uh, something about the, the orchestra, it's very exciting. And, and I'm in. I'm all in. Yeah. You know, the amount of time we spent talking about the music on the uh, during the interview was, I think, very, very valuable, but also kind of unforeseen for me. Um, and as you know, I, I love talking about the music on the show. And and, and so I was you. going to say that to him that you're the music guy. And then you jumped in there to say that you well, were like, but I'm the music guy, son. And I, I was going to tell him <laughs> no, that. No, no, no. It's no, okay. No, no reason at all. Um, I was just I was just excited to talk about that. But that just shows how much that's one aspect of the show 
that people don't even get to see. But he was right, and I said it, and he said it. It's a character, right? Yeah. It's a character of the show. Yeah. We it, it makes us experience the whole thing in a with a pretty beautiful bow that doesn't right. make us question the experience. And another know? thing that we that I didn't mention, I was remiss on on doing that, is that you know whether whether. Um, Andrew does the music, or John Debney, um, or whomever. Or McNeely. There, yeah, or, the, or Joel McNeely. There were three people that did the music in seasons one, two, and three, with maybe a smattering of one other. I did notice in episode one of New Horizons that somebody else did the music, but hmm. in all of it, it's very consistent. Um, like, I can't tell if it's a Joel McNeely episode, or if it's a John Debney episode, or if it's an Andrew Cotty episode. Um, they're all sort of... Uh, I think given the same maybe maybe vision or same sort of uh, this is how we want the music to feel and be presented um, and to have a team of creatives sort of that big all um, working together working together and producing a consistent content harmoniously yeah. actually that's not surprising considering they're all music boys yeah. that like they can work harmoniously together because their job is not to rewrite the book for the show their job is to make the show fluid, right right and i just you know i was thinking about the episode of family guy where they were doing a star wars spoof or skit and john williams died and they had to bring in um uh somebody else to do the music it was not randy newman right no it was i kind of remember this though um yeah, I'm drawing a blank on the name. But all of a sudden, the musical style was completely different and, right. and almost comical. Um, so you don't, we don't see that. We see consistency from show to show to show, even though there are several different composers. And I do like that a lot. So uh, I think look- it will change based off the length of each episode, too, because we are probably going to get a little bit more cinematic in general. So, yes. So I, think we're, I think we're up for a good 10 episodes once this season airs. I'm really excited. Yeah, same same here. And without saying too much, we're going to be able to get those episodes out to people sooner, so uh, hopefully. So, like, there's a potential where just after it airs, there probably is going to be an episode very shortly after. So we're going to do our best to do that. Um, we always love knowing what you all love about the show, so don't hesitate to go to our Twitter, which is, uh, what is it, ML underscore the Orville. You can email us at mission log dash the orville at roddenberry.com um and if you join the patreon you could talk to us on our discord there are so many ways you can get in contact with us we really want to know what you're excited for if you're on I facebook can... you can get us at mission log pod also oh there you uh, go that's the dedicated mission log facebook group but you can talk to us there too and i want to know if people like what would your questions be for not the actors but the characters of the show so if like you have like a question like Dr. Finn, what would you, I just would love to know what people want to ask. I'm going to sneeze, so I'm going to mute myself so you can wrap us out. Sure, or Gordon, you know, what's it like to hug the donkey or to exactly. John? Exactly. You know, uh, to John Lamar. Do you allow people to drink soda in engineering? Because probably, I know you wanted to drink soda on the bridge. Not. So, probably not. Uh, you know, there's some sensitive equipment down there. I, I didn't hear we'll you sneeze, get, but. I did it. Okay. I stopped myself by talking about it. I think. Um, I'm excited. Remember that you said that. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. Remember that you said that. Um, Mike, more than anything that I'm looking forward to in season three is to have another excuse to talk to you at least 10 more times. All right. Well, hopefully it'll be at least 10 more times. Uh, We'll get that. And... um... I am looking forward to that. This is uh, this is my weekly, uh, sometimes more than weekly, um, ability to reflect, to um, think of ideas, to try to make better decisions, and it's just good therapy for me, man. I uh, I enjoy talking to you, and that's why and I do so many podcasts. Good, because it's it's therapy, man. Yeah. It, it is 100%. Um, so we'll let you go. Hopefully you enjoyed the interview with uh, Seth MacFarlane as, lo- as much as we did. And we're really looking forward to Season 3, New, New Horizons, dropping on June 2nd. And look for a show to drop right after each episode of the Orville, New Horizons. Honk, honk. I don't know why. It was like the truck with trades coming. Honk, honk. Engage Quantum Drive. Mike, I'll, uh, see, you th- I'll see you then. All right. I'll see you then, too. Um, Mission Log, The Orville, is produced by Roddenberry Entertainment. Technical production by the amazing Earl Green. You can reach us at Mission Log Pod on Facebook, ML underscore The Orville on Twitter. 
You can email us at missionlog-theorville at roddenberry.com. And sleep well and prosper. (laughs) And may the force be with you. There you go. This is a Roddenberry podcast. For more great podcasts, visit podcast.roddenberry.com.